Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Lord, we come to you this morning and we just pray that you would hold back the rain as we, uh, as we seek into your word. Pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to see what you have for us today. Pray that you would touch our hearts and that we would leave changed people, better understanding who you are and how much you love us, Lord, and how we can walk differently with you as mm-hmm. our Lord and shepherd. We ask that now that you use Pastor Izzy and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, guys, would you grab your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Romans 7, 4. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. Dylan will hand out some Bibles if you need. Anybody need one? Looks like everybody's pretty covered, but uh, the Sunday school is going to be going with Aaron over to that tent over yonder. Stay out of the rain, kids. And uh, we're so grateful to have such a great wallpaper. You know, we had we had a pod of dolphins going by just a little bit ago, and it's really nice. You know, when now that we have video for YouTube, the the people that all those years heard me on the radio would say, "You don't really have dolphins and whales behind you, do you?" And and now we get to film him. Last week, Kainoa had a, a, a little lapse between the cameras, and he's like, oh, no, Pastor, there was a couple seconds, and, and you were talking about dolphins. And, and so I looked in the footage, what we had, and we had some footage of the dolphins behind you, so I put it in there to cover for that little lapse. I said, perfect. You know, that's good creative editing. And, uh, but it tells the folks that, you know, they don't believe me. I'm hoping that while I'm preaching today, a whale will come. And uh, we had two whales yesterday at Steve Hudson's uh, uh, memorial, and it was just like God winking at us, you know, because all the guys, a lot of the group were, you know, surfers and, and fishermen, and they were like, those are the first whales. Oh, Steve-O must have been talking to the boss, you know. That's how they, he must have been talking to his boss up there because he, the, he made sure some whales came for his memorial. And, it was really neat. It was like the Lord, just a little wink. You know, we don't worship whales here. We worship the, the maker of the whales. You know, the scripture says, don't worship creation. Worship the creator, the one that made it all. So he's an awesome God to serve. And, and just those little things he does to show off his handiwork. We're just surrounded. The wallpaper is beautiful. This is a perfect day. Nice, smooth, glassy. Be perfect for the whales to jump. Like right now would be good, Lord. If you could, wouldn't that be good? Like right now I go like that and it. <laughs> you guys would be like, ooh. <laughs> you'd be too full yeah. of yourself. <laughs> Jan says, I'd be too full of myself. The Lord <laughs> will wait till I'm into the message. So, Okay, let's get to the word. Romans chapter, se- chapter 7, verse 4. We got to verse 4 last week. This is where we're going to pick up. It's, a, it's one of those therefores. So whenever you see therefore, what is it therefore? It's adding to the idea of what was said before. Let me read you the, the verse. Therefore, my brethren, you were also made to die to the law. That it says, and through the body of Christ, so that you would be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. This is what we went over last week. In order for for a seed to to be fruitful, what's it have to do first? It has to go into the ground and die. It has to lose its identity as that little seed, that little kernel of wheat or corn, and it, it actually gives up its identity of that individuality. When it goes into the ground and dies, you, you've seen it on time-lapse photography where they have the little seed in the, er, in the earth with the glass and you, you watch it and the little seed starts to jump and then it splits open and then the little root and the, and the stalk come out. And when you, I, I'm only pointing this out to you so that the next time you see one of those Learning Channel specials and you see that, try to spot the seed after, after just a couple seconds. After the, after the shoot that goes up, you know, the, the, of the stalk, and the roots begin to go down, look for the seed. You know what will happen, right? I mean, maybe you don't know. That's why I want you to pay attention. The actual kernel, the seed that started that plant, breaks into two pieces and falls away. And the inner part of the, of the kernel gets absorbed into the plant and becomes the new life. And so... Paul is using something that, like, if you grew up in agricultural society, you'd be like, yeah, duh. You know, that seed has to die. But it's, 
it's not so that it's dead and has no life. It's so that it brings a new life that can be fruitful. Because one little kernel of wheat can grow into a stalk with, with multiple heads of wheat on it, and each head has 30 to 100 different seeds in it. When we die, is Paul is saying, that's when we, be, when we can become fruitful. That we can bear fruit for God. Now remember in Galatians when Paul was writing to the church at Galatia, he said that the fruit of the Spirit, who knows the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, things such as these, these kind of things. These are the fruits that God wants to bring forth in our life. But you know, for me to be kind to someone else, a little bit of dying to myself has to happen. You know, because even for me to want to put someone else first, I, I don't know if you're this way, but I pretty much am got one particular person I look out for all the time, and that's me. You know, our, our, our nature looks after ourselves. And, in, in, and after 30 years of marriage, there's my other one I look after because it says the two become one flesh. So there's my next, you know, on the list of, you know, some people call up and like, Pastor, you got to give me your full attention. And I'm like, look, I'm with my family right now. Or I'm with my wife. And they want me to forget her and like somehow put them before her. I'm like, sorry, ain't gonna wa ain't working. And they, uh, some of the guys get mad at me. Well, I'm going to go to a church where I can get a pastor, a real pastor, takes care of my needs over your wife's needs. I'm like, what kind of fruitcake are you? I mean... If I'm going to teach you how to live like Jesus wants me to live, should I take care of my wife first and then take care of the flock? But how many pastors have you heard of that fall into sin or, or have their marriages destroyed because the, the man became married to the ministry instead of to his spouse? And it happens really frequently, especially in American Christianity. It just, the, the, there's something about this whole we're, we've got to be successful in the worldly ways. We have to, we have, to have the mega ministry and, and do all these things. And so a lot of those mega ministries suck out the life of the, of the interpersonal relationships of the pastor with his family. And they compete so heavily that the guy just, he's trying to keep a balance, but it just, it, it's like a seesaw that someone put an elephant on one side and then the little guy is on the other side going, I can't seem to keep it balanced, you know. It's not working. That's, that's what happens when the ministry gets so big and it keeps pushing down and the other guy is going, I can't keep it back in equilibrium. I can't seem to. Yeah. I asked the Lord a long time ago, Lord, I don't care how big the ministry is. I just want to do it right to please you, to take care of my family. If I do that and I raise, if I could just raise my kids to come follow you, that would be, that would be cool. Because a lot of pastors I know, they, their children rebel. They're like, we're out of here. Or, or you don't care about us anyway. All you care is about the ministry. You don't care about us. That's not what we want to happen for our kids. That's n the kids need the stability of their parents, that they love them, that they're there for them. N not even n This isn't just for ministers of the gospel, guys. This is for everyone who has a, an occupation. Don't marry your occupation over your family. It will backfire. You, you, you might gain a whole bunch of riches and you'll, you'll forfeit the, the, the precious relationship of marriage. You won't have a great marriage. An empty marriage. How many of you know people are very successful worldly, but they have not really happy marriages? It's a, it's a really common malady. So Jesus is inspiring through the Holy Spirit, Paul, to say, guys, die to yourself so you can start to bear fruit to God. Join Christ. He died and he's resurrected. Now you, therefore, are joined to him through the body of Christ. You become joined to a new resurrected life, a new way of life, a life where you die to yourself and you become really fruitful for God. And so then he continues today where we pick up verse 5. He says, for while we were in the flesh, and you know that flesh, our flesh, it's all about me, take care of me, my passions. He said the sinful passions of our flesh, they were aroused by the law. Remember the, t the, the Ten Commandments that got broken down in Leviticus to 613 Levitical statutes? They, they, they didn't just take ten and say that's enough. They, they subbed them down, you know. 
break them down little by little into every little aspect. He says, my flesh, the sinful passions, they became aroused by the law of God. He says, and it says, they were at work in the members of my body to bear fruit for death. He says, but now we've been released from the law. <laughs> Having died to that which we were bound so that we can serve in newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? He said, is the law sin? He's, oh, may it never be, God forbid. On the contrary, I, he says, I would not have come to no sin except through the law. He says, for I wouldn't have known about coveting except that it says in the law, thou shalt not covet. And what's Paul say in verse 8? I love this. He said, but sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. He says, I didn't even know about this sin that resided in my members until the law said, thou shall not do this. It's kind of like, you know, this study to me is the, the study of thou shall not walk on the grass. You know, the guy, the, the, the I remember when our daughter was going to Hulu-Aloha school, we went up there and they had a little strip between the sidewalk and the ball field. And all the kids, instead of walking, the sidewalk goes 90 degrees, right? But if you have a shortcut where you can skip going this all the way down the sidewalk and turn left, and you can just kind of angle over, what are the kids going to do? You know, they just cut right through the angle of the grass. And they had cut through the angle of the grass. Now, if you don't know, Hulu-Aloha is up on our side of our mountain here, and it gets, it seems like, we live right below the school, just down at 400 foot elevation, but they're up in the thousand footish, you know, elevation, and they get rain constantly up there. You know, when our daughter was at school, they were always they had to have their umbrella with their with their school bag, and you're just thinking, well, okay, it's gonna rain. It's just every day, clouds up by the afternoon, the the clouds you know cool off, and it dumps water down on the school, and and the the man who was tasked with I felt so bad for this guy. There's a little Japanese guy I met up there, <laughs> and he had the job. I think they call him the janitor or the the custodian or something. He had to like try to replant the grass because oh, well, it rains every day, and the kids tromp through there, and so they make a they pretty much beat the grass down to it was dirt, and then the rain comes and it turns to mud, and then the kids run through the mud, and then it just tears it up more, and you had this big mud trough that was between the corner. And it was just like a simple little thing, but <laughs> we came one day and he had it all roped off. <laughs> Do not walk on the grass. And he was putting down grass seeds to try to get the you know, grass to come in. And I'm cracking up because I'm watching the kids. <laughs> and they walk up and they look at the sign that says, Do not walk on the grass. It's right there. It's plain as day. Do not walk. And it's like it's all got a string all the way from the corner all across the diagonal, everything, he's got it roped off. He's got the grass seed down. And as soon as they read the sign, their little brains, you know what they're doing, right? Yeah. <laughs> they just jump right over and run across the thing. And I'm like thinking, <laughs> you know, it would have been better if he said, please step on this. And they would have read it and gone, no, I'm not doing that. You want me to do that. You know, but when you say don't do that, is it, what is it about our nature? <laughs> That when someone says, don't do that, we're like, well, who are you to tell me not to do that? I'm going to do that. You know, you said don't, I'm going to do it. And we just, I don't know if it's just our flesh or challenge to us or what, but, but we don't like people telling us not to do something. And Paul, he didn't like it when the law said, thou shall not covet. What, what's coveting mean? When, when, you, when you want something that someone else has, it's theirs. You know, coveting... It's a dangerous sin. Because when you covet, say, say you covet your neighbor's, the Bible says don't covet your neighbor's anything. Don't covet his oxen, don't cover his, covet his servant, don't covet you know, anything that he has. But as soon as you covet something that your neighbor has, you say, I want that thing, what they have. I want that car. He's got that, that fancy, I want that car. As soon as that, that sin starts rolling around in our heart, we start figuring out, well, how do I get that car away from them? And, you know, our sinful nature is devious. I mean, we can come up with 
a couple different ways. Maybe like, maybe we could lie to them and convince them they need to get rid of that car. And, they, and, and we just happen to be there, so they need to give it to us. Or, we, we, nah, that's too easy to escape. We, look, we'll just steal the car. Or just kill the guy, and then we can just take I mean, you don't think, do you think coveting has ever led to murder? Somebody wanted something that someone else had, and they killed them just to get it? Sure. I mean, watch an old Western. It's like a recurring theme. Dude, like, I want your horse. <laughs> Take his horse, you know? I want your, I want your saddlebags. I ain't giving you my saddlebags. Bam! I got your saddlebags, you know? I mean, whatever it was, I, 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 it, it's just the way we're wired. And so Paul says, as soon as he read in the law, thou shalt not covet, he noticed that inside of him there was coveting going on. He was wanting what other people... Now, by the way, I've shared this tip. If you want a secret of how to overcome coveting, I can tell you the secret. I figured this one out. This is a, th and this one works every time. Say you're, say you're coveting your neighbor's car. We'll use that one. Don't say, God, I want my neighbor's car. What you do is you go, God, could I have a car like my neighbor's car? I don't have to have my neighbor's car. One like it. And see, for all you know, God might say, I don't want you to have his car. His is a lemon under the hood. You just don't know it. It's about to blow up another 20 miles down the road. It's going to throw a rod, and it's going to be over. The engine's toasted. And you'll be going, but I want his car. And God's going, I ain't giving you his car. I don't want to curse you. I want to bless you. And you could get a better blessing by just saying, God, could I have one like it? Maybe one that's not going to have a bum engine. Or is going to have a bad brake job, or, or whatever the problem is. See, because we have a God who knows all things, don't we? It's better to go with His plan and say, I'll take one like... No. By the way, guys, this works even for some of you covet other people's spouses. Don't do that. You say, God, could I have one like that? Not that person, because that person was already given to someone else. Leave that alone. You're just going to be led into sin, and that'll get you into trouble. But don't covet anything of someone else. Now, Paul said, as soon as he read it, he was done. I mean, thou shalt not covet. He went, okay. Thou shalt not bear false witness. No lying. You ever read that? That's one of the rules. Do not lie. Do we lie? Oops. Paul says, as soon as I read this stuff, I was like, I was in trouble. And he says, I was once alive apart from the law. I didn't know this stuff. I was living life. As soon as the commandment came, he says, that sin became alive in me, and, <laughs> and I died. He went, wow, I'm in trouble. And it says, in this, this commandment, which was to result in life, actually proved to result in death for me. He, he found out that this commandment brought death to him. He said, for sin, look at verse 11, taking opportunity through the commandment deceived me. And through it, he says, it killed me. As soon as, he goes, as, soon as I learned this stuff, thou shalt not do this, I was doing it. And then he realized, I got a problem. So then, verse 12, he says, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and it's righteous, and it's good. The law itself is good. But he said, therefore, verse 13, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. In other words, Paul's saying, once I saw the rules that said, thou shall not do this and thou shall not do that, he went, I found out I'm a, I'm a rule breaker. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm blowing it. I'm a sinner. Now, I don't know if any of you really needed any schooling in that area. I, I didn't. I was like, I know I'm a sinner. It wasn't like, I, I, I never really went to church thinking that the, the minister had to tell me that I was a sinner. I went already knowing that. I wanted to know what do I do about it. But 
We already saw in Romans 3, 23, Paul said, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So why the law? You know, we have the Old Testament law. And have any of you run into some groups of uh, sects of, uh, they, they call themselves Christians, but they say, we're Christians, but we follow the law too. We follow Jesus, but we also adhere to the law. We're, we're um, well, there's some groups like uh, Seventh-day Adventists. We, the law, we, we, do you guys worship on Sunday? They'll ask you right away. Do you eat pork? Do you do anything what is against the Jewish law? And they'll tell you that, well, we follow the Lord, but we follow the law too. And they act like somehow this makes them better than all the rest of the groups. I mean, I've run into some of them tell me, you guys, you worship on Sunday, you've taken the mark of the beast because you, you don't follow the law. I said, listen, the law had a job to do. His job was to be a tutor, it says in Galatians, to lead me to Christ. Once the tutor has done his job, do I need to keep going to the tutor? No, because I've already been led to the head of the body, Christ himself. And that's the one where the life comes from. That's the one that we serve in, in this, what, we're, what we've been studying, in newness of life. Sometimes some of these people, they get so into this, I'm going to follow the law. I'm like, have you read the thing? Really, how, how many of you sat down and read the book of Leviticus? I know it's really exciting, dry read. But if you read it, and you really read it like, I'm going to read this so that I can obey and follow these statutes. How far do you make it? How many pages? I mean, really. Sincerely. I mean, if you read those rules, we bust, like we're busted, not even a page in. And there's a lot of pages to Leviticus. And so you keep reading, you're like, oh, man, am I, I blew it here, and I blew it there, and I blew it. And Paul, Paul said, all he had to do is read one. Do not step on the grass, and he stepped on the grass. I mean, one, do not covet, and he was like, I blew it. And he, he, it, it kind of became a quagmire to him because so many of the Jewish people were teaching that the law, you must follow. Now, you might not understand the, the mentality of this, but let me explain to you. They thought that if they followed the law, they would be approved by God. Like you earned your your approval through your obedience to the law. The better you did the law, the more that God was pleased with you. The problem is, Paul said, and the more I learned the law, and by the way, did Paul know the law? Was he a student of the, of the scriptures? Yeah, he, was, he had the title Pharisee of Pharisees. Studied uh, under one of the most premier leading Jewish rabbis, Gamaliel. He was, he was very learned in the scripture. To even get the title, Pharisee of Pharisees, you had to hand write out a copy of the scroll of Isaiah, every jot and tittle, with no mistakes, and commit it to memory. The entire, we, we'd say, book of Isaiah, which is not a short one, by the way, in the Old Testament. It's a long one. You, he was schooled. He knew, the, he knew the, what we call our Old Testament, their scriptures. He was a student of them. But he's the one saying to us, guys, this is about having new life. And new life does not come from being bound under the law. In fact, new life comes from being bound to the, listen to this, verse 6. Now we have been released from the law, having died to that which we were bound. It says, so that we might serve in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter referring to the letter of the law. No more are we going with that, let's follow the letter of the law, let's follow the spirit of the law. You know, when you learn the spirit of the law, Jesus, and by the way, did Jesus say I came to get rid of the law? No, he said I didn't come to, to, to abolish the law. I came to what? Fulfill it. Well, you say, well, what was the requirement? What, what did he have to do to fulfill the law? He had to be a perfect, unblemished lamb. Not a single, there was not one point of the law that he broke. To fulfill it, he had to live it out. And then, 
in that perfection. That, that, that's the part that I can't do. He lived out the law to the fullest extent, every part fulfilled. He said, Jesus, did you covet? Nope, didn't go there. Did you, did you commit adultery? Did you, did you fornicate? Did you do any of the law? Did you, did you ever lie? Think about this. Did Jesus lie? No. He said, I am the way, the what? Truth and the life. No one, he says, gets to the Father except through me. He came to be the sacrifice to help us get to God. But when it came to the law, the requirements of the law were really strict. And he fulfilled it so that he, he said, I came so that it's not abolished, it's fulfilled. Now, you have some, a lamb, a lamb that has paid the price for all the sins of the world. And now what do we have to do to have everlasting life? Believe on him, right? He did the, he, he did the heavy work, guys. He paid. That's the big deal. He paid for our sins, and it's done. And now we can be joined to him, and we can learn to not serve under the oldness of the letter, but now the newness of the Spirit. This is what God really desires, is people that will follow him by the, by the newness of his Spirit. His Holy Spirit wants to, you know, they were trying to, trick Jesus. Remember that guy that came and he tested Jesus. What's the what's the greatest of the of the of the commandments? What's the what's the biggie ones? That, remember that attorney? You know attorneys they love to argue little points of the law. And Jesus says, "Well, how's it read to you?" And interesting, he quotes right from Deuteronomy, the part, "Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your what? Mind, your soul, and your strength. And, and, and the second is like unto the first. He says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus said, good job. Go do it. You got it. In fact, you, another one of the Gospels records that Jesus teaches that those are the very things that the whole law hung upon. I'm kind of wondering, see, I don't know this, but I'm wondering if the attorney was in the crowd and heard Jesus teach it. And then he went to test him. And I wouldn't be surprised. You know how those attorneys can be. So he, he's like, so what's the greatest good? How's it read to you? Jesus like throws it back at him. So how's it read to you? Well, you got to love God and you got to love your neighbor. Good job. Go do it. And you shall live, Jesus said. And then it says, wishing to justify himself. He said, and who is my neighbor? Like, I have to love everyone? Mm -hmm. Who's my neighbor? And that's when Jesus tells the, the story of the Good Samaritan. Remember that story where the, where the man comes and he's passing from the... It's in Jerusalem. If you go from Jerusalem down toward Jericho, there's a, there's a valley. It's a deep ravine. And down in the deep part, it's kind of narrow. Craig, at some points, really narrow. And down in that valley, there's a little brook. And if you were to, I mean, this is a desert region. If you, how many of you have been to Israel? This, my wife's been there. You've been there? So as you come over the Mount of Olives and you go the back way, over the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem and head down towards Jericho, there's a valley, what is, is termed in Hebrew, the Valley of the Shadow of Death. The reason it's called that is because it's also called the Valley of the Thieves because it was a great place for thieves to sit in the, in the caves and the hide up in the crags on each side of the ravine and wait for passersby to jump them. I mean, you're out in the middle of nowhere and you knew that the people were going to go down in the cool part of the valley because up on the top, it's, it can be scorching. It can be 105 degrees out in the desert, just dry, dry air, no water. So you're going to go down to where the water is and go walking along where it's green down there. And the thieves would just wait to pounce on people. So what's Jesus do? He says, let me tell you a story. There was a guy. He was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell into the hands of these thieves. And it says, and they stripped him. They beat him. They left him half dead. They took all of his stuff, robbed him, and, and, and cast him to the side. They're just right there on the road. And, he, and Jesus said, and there was a, no, I like this part of the story. You guys know this story, right? 
He's going to pick three different people that are going to pass by. First, he picks a Jewish teacher, rabbi, you know. Comes by and sees the man beaten. Well, I don't have time to, you know, I got to get to temple. I got to teach. You know, I'm an important guy. Pulls his robe to his side. In other words, like, I don't want to touch that unclean guy on the side of the road. And besides that, he's a Samaritan. If you don't know this, Samaritans are half Jews. In Jewish culture, they're kind of looked at with disdain, like a, like you're not a pure Jew. You came from when we were conquered and, and, and our women were humiliated. You're the offspring of our enemy. That's the mindset that they have toward the Samaritan. So they went, mm, i got to get to the temple. And he just walks on by. And a Levite comes by, and those, that's the tribe that the priests come from. He sees the guy, and he passes Oh, no, I'm going to stay away from that guy. And goes on the other, and heads on by, leaves the guy there, beaten, half dead, naked. And Jesus, Jesus says, and then a Samaritan comes by. I'm sorry, did I say this guy was a Samaritan? I, I think I said it wrong. The, he's a Jew. I'm sorry, he's a Jew. The guy who comes by is a Samaritan, the, the one, the enemy the, the, the half-breed, he comes by and sees the man, it says, and lifts him up, and he bandages him. He puts his own oil on the wounds, and, and, and it'd be like what we call administering first aid. You know, he, he, he puts some salve on him, and he puts him on his beast of burden, and he takes him all the way to the inn, and he tells the innkeeper, take care of this fellow. I've got to go do some business, but whatever it costs you, I'll pay it when I come back. And Jesus said, which one of these men proved to be a neighbor to the Samaritan? I mean, I'm oh, sorry. To the I keep the, I'm tired. I admit it. It was a long day yesterday. Which one proved to be the neighbor? And, and this guy, I, I'm sure the attorney's going, I don't like the answer. <laughs> because it's a Samaritan. The good Samaritan story is like showing that it's not, your genealogy is not your Jewishness. It's not your following of the lawness that makes you approved by God. It's, it's you showing compassion. And Jesus asked him, which one showed compassion to that man that fell into the hands of the thieves? And I guess the Samaritan. He said, go and do the same. Go show compassion. Now, that's the spirit of the law. Right there. The spirit of God's law is that we be compassionate to our, to our fellow man. To someone in need. We show what it says. How You guys probably heard this growing up, didn't you? The golden rule. Do unto others as you have them what? Do unto you. That's the spirit of the law. I don't have to teach you all the little things about, you know, if, if your neighbor's animal comes and... and and kills your animal, then, you know, the law actually gives down to the detail what you have to do, what to do with the dead animal, how to repay the guy who lost his animal, the whole thing. If you love your neighbor and you your animal caused his animal harm, what would you do out of love? Would you take care of it? I mean, just the, just the, out of love and compassion, be like, oh, man, I'm sorry you lost your animal. Let me see, what can I do to make it right? Can I give you one of my animals? Can I get you another animal? Can I buy you one? You, you don't need a law to tell you to do that because the spirit of the law is alive in you. And this is where when we learn to die to our flesh and we say, God, let us be resurrected with your son. Let us walk in that newness of the spirit. We start just doing these things because it's just the spirit of the law. It's what Jesus would do. And if you ever don't know what the spirit of the law is, like you've you're, you're got a question, you're, you're going, what should I do in this circuit? Just do this. What would Jesus do? You know, the kids have little bracelets, WWJD. What would Jesus do? Just think, what would he do? Because truly, if you ask yourself that question, you say, what would Jesus do right here? What would he do to help this person? How would he help them? You will come to the spirit, of God's spirit of, of the law. Because Jesus said, Guys, I'm going to go now. When he, went to, when he went to the cross, right before he left the earth, he said, I'm going to go to my father's house, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. Don't let your heart be troubled. I'm coming back. I'll get you. I'll bring you to where I am. 
And he says, in my father's house, there's many what? Mansions. He says, and, 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 and I'll bring you so that you would be where I am. I want you to be with me. But he told his disciples, he says, guys, don't worry. I've got a, I've got a gift I'm going to leave you. It's, in fact, it's to your advantage. I go away, and I'm going to send you a helper. This helper is called the Holy Spirit. And Jesus knew while he was humbled in the state of a man on this earth, he could only be in one physical location at a time. But how limited is God's spirit? Can God's spirit be with all of us at the same time? He says, I'm telling you, it's to your advantage. I go away and I send you the Holy Ghost, the helper, because he'll be with all of you. And they were going, oh, man, don't leave. There goes our free lunch card. You know, well, there goes the guy who does all the miracles. And, and he goes, no, I'm sending my spirit. And he says, and greater things, what you've seen me do, greater things will you do. You know, after the, you read about the early church. Did they have miracles happen? You know, after Christ left, did they pray for the sick? Did they get healed? Did they see miracles of, you know, the food multiplying, like when Jesus multiplied the loaves? Yeah. You read church history. The, there was cool stuff. Does that stuff still happen today? See, this is, I, and I got to tell you, the people who are really into the letter of the law, they do this. I don't see it. I'm looking at the law, and I don't see anywhere where there's loaves and fish and food multiplying. I never seen no food. Mul I said, you've never been to our feeding. <laughs> you know, we've had weeks where there's like very little and a really big line. And I just go, Lord, could you pull off one of those? Things? And you know what he does? Just ma make the food keep going until everyone is fed. And I love those days because the people serving are like, you're not going to believe it. it was down to the last scoop. And I scooped and I put a plate and then another guy came up. And I looked down, and there was another scoop. And I'm thinking, I believe it. Because, I mean, really, was that really hard for God? A little extra scrambled eggs. There you go. He went, oh, that was a big one. <laughs> no, man, the Lord's going, there's nothing. But see, we serve a God, and his spirit's powerful. And we're shortchanging, we're shortchanging, really, a lot of people's experience to help their faith because we, we don't, express how great he is in in our culture everybody wants to make the pastor the one that's great they want to look at the man or something you know and, and i'm like don't look at us look at christ he's the great one man that's that, that's the guy i'm serving that's the one i want to that's the one paul said you can be an imitator of me as i'm an imitator of christ you know i'm just here to to show you an example because i'm just imitating him and we do learn by example. I don't mind saying, you don't know how to do it? Okay, copy me. But some of you older Christians, I want to challenge you. Find some young one who's just starting out in their faith and doesn't know how to do it. And if you want to see where your walk is a little bit shaky, just go to that young one and say, okay, I know you're just starting out. I want you to feel free to copy anything you see me do as I copy Jesus. You want to find out how quick the areas you're not really copying Jesus in show up? Because as soon as you do that, right, the, the new Christian will be going, am I supposed to do that? <laughs> It'll bust you, man. It's <laughs> See, how many of you could do that? Right now, you could, if I said, look, I got a brand new believer. They just gave their life to the Lord this morning, and they want to know how to do this. Can I send them home with you for the week? I just need you to just live your life before him as a Christian. Show him how to do, you know, each day. What, what do you do when you get up? You seek the Lord. You, you, you go help, do whatever. You go to your job. Just let him follow you. Let him see how you conduct yourself in Christ. You want to see how quick areas will float to the top that need a little skimming off? A little dross removal, we call it. You know, when, when they purify metal, they put it under the heat. In the, in the crucible, they turn up the heat and all the impurities float to the top. And then the metalsmith, he, he takes this little like angled piece of metal and he skims across the top and he pulls this black sooty garbage off and he smacks it and says, that doesn't belong in there. And then he turns the fire up a little more. 
and the finer particles start to bubble up. And this is the very word for trying metal that Paul says God wants to try our hearts. He wants to test us. He wants to put us through the fire and bring out the crud so he can make us into pure gold, into valuable metal that has been refined. And some Christians in our culture have not got through much refining. And they don't even realize how rough and raw they are because they've never really thought about, hey, what if I had to... Now, some of you parents, you already got nailed because you were raising kids. And, you, you know, kids are amazing. They're like, I don't think you should do that. <laughs> how do they... Like, they know. It's like this, their little spirit knows. That's not good to do. And you're just going along doing it every day. And, but as soon as you have a kid, you realize some of the stuff you used to do, you maybe shouldn't do. How many people change their behavior after their kids, their, their children come along? You know, the partying ways. They go, uh, probably shouldn't be partying every night. You know, I used to drink till I was blitzed out. And then, you know, <laughs> kids came along and I was like, that's probably not the best example. We have so many people that change their ways when they know someone else is watching them to learn. But see, if you don't realize it, your life is meant to be lived so people can look at you and they can learn about Christ by just seeing Him shine through you. And they're just looking at you going, hmm. It's not about teaching you the letter of the law, but it is about teaching you the Spirit. The Spirit of Christ, what He wants you to do. And this week, I want to encourage you. Now, next week, we're going to come to this quagmire Paul is going to lead to. Now, now he's going to start to explain the very thing I don't want to do, I do do. The very things I do want to do, I don't do. I call this the Romans 7 doo-doo chapter. Because this part is, I, I can totally, have you ever felt like that? If you've ever felt like the very thing you said you weren't going to do, you did, or thing you were you knew you're supposed to do but you didn't do or has, has anyone ever read the rest of this chapter and felt like Paul I am so glad you put this in the Bible because I can identify you're going to love next week's sermon this this portion of scripture the end of Romans 7 it really I don't know it's a comfort to my heart it makes me realize if Paul the apostle had said that stuff and God, did he use that guy? I mean, how'd you like to have, like, you know, on your resume, spiritual resume? So what did you do for the Lord? Well, I helped pen, like, half the New Testament. I mean, is that kind of good? You know, like, but yeah, just put that down on my resume. And plant a few churches and, you know, do a few missionary journeys and see hundreds of thousands come to Christ. And yeah, they put that down. But if he's going to say what he says next week, what you, we, we see here, well, you can read ahead. He said it a long time ago. But he's going to say that even he had trouble. The very things he wanted to do, he didn't do. The very things he didn't want to do, he did. And he's going to come to a thing that I honestly have to share the secret at the end of that because when it gets all done, he's, he's going to declare, who is going to set me free from this body? of sin and death. My body, he says, it's sinful. It's, I need to, I need to be, and then he's going to say the answer in Romans 8, verse 1. I'm not telling you, you got to read it yourself. Because, you know, that's the fun. I, I already read it. I know what it says. And sometimes the teachers, uh, American Christians are the laziest. They want to be spoon-fed. Tell me what it says. Tell me it all. I'm like, read it yourself. It's there. Do you have a Bible? Do you need one? If you, it, some of the people are watching, they're going to be watching this on the Internet. It's okay. Just go to AmazingGraceKona.com. Go to Pastor Izzy's favorite links. If you don't have a Bible, I got five different Bible resources on the Internet, free Bibles. You can read in any language. Doesn't have to be in English. Maybe that's not your first language like myself. You can click on the Italian Bible. There's actually three different ones on there. 
You can read in whatever your native tongue. We have it like in all different translations. And you can look up the words, what they mean. You say you want to know, where does that word come from? You can click on the Blue Letter Bible and, and fo follow the link to the, to the concordance. And you can see where, where I learn these things. It's beautiful. But I want you guys to be able to do it. You know, have some fun with it. Well, I, <laughs> I feel more rain coming. And I can hear the tent going, tet, 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 tet. Which means we have to take all these things back out this week and dry them off. Because we put them away once wet. <laughs> and we left them for a whole week. Clueless is early days. You know what happens with a week inside of a trailer? Turned to mildew. We had to wash and bleach and do all of it. So this week when James and Sarah look across the street at our house and see all these tents set up in our yard, drying, they'll know what's going on as we get to have fun. Come help, yes, please. Please, Spirit, lead him to come help. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these words of encouragement from the Scripture, Lord, that you would have Paul to write these things. I know a lot of Christians struggle with why the law, what do we do with the law, and they don't get to learn this simple truth that Paul shared, to just live the spirit of the law. Lord, help us to walk in your spirit. Help us to be led of your spirit. Even as we go from here, Lord, we ask that you would just pour out your Holy Spirit into each of us to overflowing, that we could be led and guided through this next week. Let us live like Jesus would want us to live. Help us imitate him, we pray, as we go from here. In, in Christ's name we pray. And everyone that agree with me said? Amen. Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.